There's a passage in the canon where the Buddha is giving meditation advice to a venerable Anuruddha. The story goes that the Buddha was in Gosambi, and the monks had fallen into two factions, arguing with each other. And the Buddha tried to bring some harmony into the Sangha, and they basically said to him, you just, you just be the Buddha, we'll take care of this quarrel ourselves. So he left the city, went out into the wilderness, and came across Venerable Anuruddha with two other monks who were living a very peaceful life. But even so, Anuruddha said to the Buddha that he would try to get his mind to stay centered. And he was actually having visions of light and forms, but then they would disappear. He wondered why. Then the Buddha talks about how he himself, as he was practicing before his awakening, would have visions of light and forms, but then they would disappear. And so he analyzed what was going on in his mind. And he came up with a long checklist of things that can go wrong in the meditation that would make you lose your concentration. And although some of them have to do with specifically that type of meditation where you're seeing visions and seeing light. There are eight factors that deal with any kind of concentration, and so they provide a good checklist for any kind of concentration, whether you're focusing on the breath, focusing on a part of the body, focusing on the brahmaviharas. When you lose your focus, you can ask yourself why, and think of the eight different things that the Buddha mentioned. Two of them correspond to the traditional list of five hindrances. There's doubt and there's sloth and torpor. In the case of doubt, you're sitting with the breath, and all of a sudden you wonder, is this really breath? These sensations I'm feeling in the body, do they really correspond to the breath? And once that question comes up, you lose your concentration. You're going to remind yourself that the fact that you feel the body at all has to pass through the breath, so that everything you feel in the body comes through the breath element, the wind element. And then you can divide things up. There are motions in the body that are breath motions, and there are motions that are the movement of the water element, say the blood through the vessels. And the distinction there is that the blood through the vessels when it pushes up against the vessel walls, you will feel pressure, whereas breath doesn't have any pressure. It's an energy. Think of it flowing through the spaces between the atoms. So whenever there's a feeling of pressure in the body as you move the breath around, you realize, okay, you've been moving the water element around. And hold in mind the perception that just breath can go anywhere can permeate anything. And see if holding that perception helps you overcome your doubt. As for sloth and torpor, the way to deal with that, of course, is in line with the traditional list that the Buddha gives. Change your meditation object. Rub your limbs. If you have any chants that you've memorized, run them over in your mind. Or if you're out sitting alone in the orchard, you're not going to disturb anybody. You can start chanting out loud. And the fact that you have to call on your memory may help wake you up. If that doesn't wake you up, get up and do walking meditation. And John Cha would add, try doing walking meditation backwards. And if that doesn't wake you up, then of course it's a sign that you really do need some rest. So you lie down but with the perception in mind that you're going to get up as soon as you wake up again. The other factors in the list that are not in the hindrances have to do with maintaining the right emotional balance as you stay focused. One of the problems you may run into is inattention. In other words, you're paying attention to the breath and all of a sudden your mind slips off to something else. All I have to do is just reestablish attention at the breath. But then to maintain it, you may have to deal with other issues. The 
the Buddha mentions boredom as a possible problem. You're sitting here and nothing seems to be happening. You have to remind yourself, everything in the world is happening right now. In other words, all the processes by which the mind creates its experience out of the raw data of sensory input is all happening right here. And the way the mind relates to any object is happening in the course of its relating to the breath. So if you find yourself getting bored with the breath, you can either play around with the breath more, or you can start looking at how the mind relates to the breath. What is the perception it holds with regard to the breath? What is the conversation it's having with itself about the breath? In other words, think about the, the different aggregates that are playing a role right now. What's form? What's feeling right now? What's perception? What's fabrication? What's consciousness? How do these things work together to create a state of concentration? Can you see that? Look. Take an interest. You realize there's nothing to get bored about. All the processes by which the mind is creating suffering for itself are happening right here. And if you can't find something interesting in that, ask yourself what's wrong. What part of the mind doesn't want to look? So basically the way to overcome boredom is to ask questions based on what you know of the Dharma, what you've learned about what happens as the mind deals with its sensory experience. And ask yourself, can I see that happening right now? Two other problems are mirror problems. Too much effort, too little effort. Too much effort, the Buddha compares to holding a baby quail in your hand and basically strangling it, holding it so hard that it dies. Too little effort is like holding the baby quail in your hand, but so loosely that the baby quail flies away. Now, in some cases, this can actually be related to the amount of pressure you're putting on the breath. You can put too much pressure on the breath, too little pressure. Too much pressure in your focus, too little pressure. So look at the strength of your focus. And if you find that getting the mind to settle down with the breath makes things feel tight and constricted in the body, okay, you're putting too much pressure on. Back off a bit. If you find the mind wandering in and out, coming into focus, going out of focus, you okay, put some more pressure on. Then the final pair on the list have to do with things happening in the meditation, either that you like a lot or you don't like a lot. The ones that you like a lot, the Buddha says, you get excited and you lose the concentration. In other words, the mind settles down and suddenly you realize, hey, the mind has settled down. The mind hasn't been talking to itself for a while. You realize, wow, the mind hasn't been talking, and that's the end of it. This is where you have to take a very matter-of-fact attitude toward it. Now, whatever comes up, you can't jump to the conclusion that it's really good yet. You have to watch it for a while to see. And particularly, you have to watch what the mind does in reaction. Because this point carries all the way through, even when you reach the threshold to the noble attainments. If you hit the deathless but get excited about it, well, that's as far as you're going to get. You'll lose it. It doesn't mean that you haven't experienced it. It simply means that that's as far as that attainment is going to go, right, right then and there. So you want to develop that attitude that whatever happens, you're just going to watch it. This also applies to the other and last item on the list, which is panic. Something comes up and you don't feel comfortable about it at all. You're afraid of it. And suddenly you're out of concentration. 
We'll try to go back to the state of mind you had just before and watch. As long as you're alert to what the mind is doing, then you're okay. There are some people who, when rapture comes, feel really threatened by it. In some cases, it's because they had near drowning experiences in the past, and it seems too much like drowning. Or there's a sense of losing control. But as long as you keep your focus with the breath, you're alert to what you're doing. You can watch what happens and learn to talk to yourself. You're not drowning. You're surrounded by air. And what may seem like a loss of control is simply going into new territory. And if you don't feel comfortable at all with the new territory, back up. Go back to where you were. And then when you come out of meditation, you can talk it over with the teacher. But both for the excitement and for the panic. Think of John Munn's advice to John Mahabua. Something comes up and you're not sure about it, just stay with your sense of awareness, your alertness. knowing what's happening, but without coming to any final decision about whether it's good or bad. And then after a while it'll pass, and you will have maintained your, your center here, you will have maintained your concentration in the face of things that are new and unexpected. So basically what this checklist is getting at is that you want to keep your mind on an even keel, alert but not too excited, calm but not bored and sleepy. It's a balancing act. And as with anyone walking across a tightrope, <coughs> you don't expect that you will be perfectly balanced and just float across the tightrope. There will be a leaning to the left and a leaning to the right, but you learn how to correct. This ability to perform self-correction is one of the most important skills in the path. It's like learning how to stand on one leg in yoga. There'll be a wobbling back and forth and back and forth, but you learn how to correct. And that's how you keep your balance. It's the same with the concentration. There will be a leaning to the left, a leaning to the right, a little too much energy, a little too little energy. But when you know the different ways in which the mind can get out of balance, and you, you can bring it back in. And that's how you maintain your concentration over time. 